Hey everybody, welcome to the next video. We're now Hello. in unit nine. We're gonna be talking about kinetics and equilibrium and this is gonna be our first lesson which is all about potential energy diagrams. Where you should be looking for help on unit nine in the Regents Review Book, the Topic 8, Regents Textbook, Chapter 18, and the Honors Textbook, Chapter 13 and 14. So in this lesson we're gonna be talking about what is collision theory. We're gonna be going over some major important vocabulary for this unit. We're going to be learning how to draw potential energy diagrams and how to differentiate the difference between endothermic and exothermic PE diagrams. Potential energy, not physical education. That is true. Okay, so collision theory. It's my favorite theory. Collision so, theory is the theory of colliding. More or less. Basically. But the most important thing that you need to know about collision theory is, is that these particles that are slamming into each other need to have enough potential energy and the right orientation. Now orientation just means the way that they're positioned when they collide. So each collision may not actually be effective if they're not in the proper uh, orientation. Orientation, <laughs> space, location. Location, right. So the picture on the left that just popped up that's labeled A, you're noticing that you have two different types of elements and they are combining with the right amount of force and energy in the right locations making two water molecules. But the picture on the right is showing again the same reactants but they're now in a different orientation meaning that the particles are physically not touching the same locations and you're noticing that they are not making a product. Think of Legos. If you put Legos together um, in the right way they'll connect but if you put Legos together that don't have um, opposite ends, they're not going to actually connect to one another. So same idea, no matter how, much, how many times you actually push them together, unless they're in the right orientation to one another, they won't connect. So this is the important vocabulary. Potential energy diagrams. These are used to track the amount of energy absorbed or released during the reaction period. And the activated complex, which we call also the transition state, is going to be what we call an unstable arrangement of atoms that forms momentarily at the peak of every potential energy diagram. So again, we're starting with two moles of H2 gas with one mole of oxygen gas, and we're noticing in the middle picture that's our activated complex. It's a funky formation that is a hybrid of your reactants and a hybrid of your products. And again, you can't get there unless you have the proper orientation and the proper amount of energy for that. So speaking about that proper energy, we call that the activation energy. And that's the minimum amount of kilojoules required to make the collision or make that reaction take place. And we're referring to potential energy. Whenever we refer to any type of energy in this concept, it's always about how much potential energy is there. Now heat of reaction we spoke about in the last unit, it's the amount of heat needed to either be absorbed or released for the actual reaction to happen. You can calculate your delta H by subtracting the difference in your energy of your reactants and the energy of the products. So how do we draw potential energy diagrams? Well to start we need our basic grid showing an x and y axis. On the y axis we're going to be plugging in potential energy. Potential energy dominantly is in kilojoules. On the x axis we are going to put in what we call the reaction progress which is just time. Sometimes it's called the reaction coordinate, sometimes it's called progress. It means the same thing. Sometimes these y and x axes have numbers, sometimes they don't. So we start off by drawing our first horizontal line. And that first horizontal line we call the energy of the reactants. Why? Because the reactants are on the left hand side of all chemical equations and we can actually determine on the y axis what that actual numerical value is. So in this situation we're going to be using two moles of H2 gas and one mole of O2 gas. During the reaction, we're going to see those reactants colliding, but as they're colliding, they're going to build up energy and build up and build up and build up. Eventually, they're going to reach that activation complex, which is the top or the peak of this chart. Which is also called the transition state. But we can also now use the activation complex, its peak, and the energy of the reactants to figure out what the activation energy is in total to make this reaction happen. So simply, activation complex minus the energy of the reactants gives you activation energy. You might have heard of this in your living environment class last year. Some, some of your teachers definitely talk about activation energy. Now, you finish off by drawing another horizontal line, and this horizontal line is going to represent the energy of your products. 
So in this situation, those original hydrogen and oxygen molecules combine together, and they give you two moles of H2O. So if you notice the next blue line that just appeared, the difference between your activation complex and the energy of the products is going to be what we call the reverse activation energy, which means if you want to take that, those H2O molecules and convert them back into their original basic form, you need to add a little bit of energy and the reaction will go in the reverse. We also notice if you find the energy of the reactants and compare it to the energy of the products, that is your delta H, that is the overall heat of the reaction. There's always going to be an increase and a decrease of energy in all these potential energy diagrams. How much increase and how much decrease will eventually be the heat of the reaction. And that will determine whether it is an endothermic or an exothermic process. So just so you guys remember, breaking bonds requires energy. On the left, at the bottom of that hill, we have bromine, diatomic bromine as a gas. And as you see, as you increase the amount of energy, the bonds are kind of getting further and further apart until they eventually snap and the bonds break, making two moles of just bromine, two separate atoms of bromine. This is what an endothermic reaction looks like. Notice that the gain of energy from reactants to the activated complex is more than the loss of energy from the activated complex to the products. So you're gaining more than you actually lose, which means it's endothermic. And you should have a positive delta H. So when you go back to table I, you'll see that positive delta H value. The opposite of an endothermic reaction still is an exothermic reaction. And that means an exothermic reaction is showing you the reverse of a potential energy diagram. So as we also are noticing in this diagram, the difference in the reaction energy and the difference in your product energy, your delta H, should now be a negative value. Again, if you go to table I, all negative values are going to be exothermic and their graphs are going to resemble what you are looking at right now. And look at the, the diagram again. More lost heat. So if there's more lost than gained, it's going to be negative. All right, so stuff you should have learned. In this video, we talked about what is collision theory. We also talked about potential energy diagram vocabulary. We also learned how to draw and label a potential energy diagram. And we talked about the differences between endo and exothermic diagrams. Other than that... See you next time. <laughs>